Okay, so let me move to today's talk on early modern alchemy. Um, now, our collections at the Institute the Library, we have something like 6,000 rare books and manuscripts dating from the 15th century, uh, many of which relate to um, alchemy. We also have 90 paintings and uh, 200 works on paper depicting alchemists. So very often there is someone uh, in the building working on the history of alchemy. And George is, is one of those people. He was with us for the past six weeks uh, as a short-term fellow, an Uliot scholar, uh, doing research on, on these collections uh, towards his, his dissertation. Um, He's a third-year PhD student at Brown, um, and it's it's a dissertation that focuses on the physi physician and alchemist Gershom Bulkley. He'll tell me if I've pronounced that correctly uh, very soon. His dissertation is titled Alchemy in the Home, Colonial Connecticut and Household Science in the 17th Century Anglo-Atlantic World. Um, now, one way of approaching the history of alchemy is, is to ask how um how alchemists contributed to the development of of modern chemistry and there is a lot of history that approaches the topic from um from that angle but uh, i understand that george uh is really trying to embed his work more deeply in the historical uh context particularly through his attention to the site at which alchemy is practiced uh, and also the people involved so I'll hand over to you now uh, to George, who will tell you more about his dissertation and then how his presentation um, relates to them. So, George, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure that you're talking to us today. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Daniel. Um, and yeah, it's Gershom Buckley, but I uh, understand with the spelling. So, um, yes. So, uh, my um, talk today will. Um, start off broadly with kind of a narration that kind of looks at the, uh, my dissertation as a whole, but it will transition then to kind of looking at a specific question about, about the dissertation. So I'll just go ahead and get started. Okay. In December of 1681, the former town minister, Gershom Buckley, now full-time physician and alchemist, bought a home on the Weathersfield town, Connecticut town green. The house, like many of its neighbors, was two stories tall, included a prominent central chimney, which protruded from its shingled roof. Its casement windows were, were filled with small diamond-leaded panes, which, when viewed, tempered the sunlight with a greenish hue. Its sides were covered in clapboards, which, in the coming years, would need replacement or repair. However, it was out of the back of the home it projected its most distinctive feature, the lean-to addition, with its sharp dropping roof that came to rest low above the first story in the back, and which gave the house its commonplace name of the New England box. Buckley was preparing to move growing the family into this home at the center of Weathersfield, Connecticut, a town just south of Hartford, seen here, um, approximately here. And to continue his research into alchemy and the chemical production of medicines for his New England patients, the house was well suited for such task. In the parlor in the first floor, where his wife and himself would have their main bed, he would place his chest of drawers and other furniture, filling them with his medicines for his visiting patients. In this room, he would speak with New England residents, English, African, and occasionally Native American, and prescribe those treatments he felt were most well suited for his ailments. In his back room, cellar, and garret, he would store many of his imported wares and ingredients. The back room was near his parlor, and would be where he placed those goods, sold goods awaiting delivery or pickup by his patients. The cellar would hold many of his roots and plants, which his family would preserve during the summer and fall months and put away before winter. The garret or attic above the second story would hold many things, but include most importantly his still and wooden tub for the brewing of beer and wine 
important vehicles for the consumption of the foul tasting chemical medicines he often prescribed. Finally, in his parlor chamber, he would have his laboratory where he would bring ingredients and in his alchemical knowledge together to experiment and produce medicine for his patients. However, other rooms would be, become important as well. The kitchen, a space normally dedicated to the cooking and preparing of food, at times would become an extension of his laboratory, holding and heating some of his preparations. The hall, a place where family gathered and spent the most time together, would become the sometimes source of laboratory instruments when others were found wanting. Yet beyond the house itself would grow the gardens, uh, the Buckley's gardens, orchard, and farm, from which they would grow many fruits and plants to stock their shelves. Further beyond even their farm lay the forest and meadows from which they would also draw ingredients, while just down the road from their house lay the Weathersfield warehouses and docks, where ships from the Atlantic would land and unload their wares from distant ports in the Caribbean, London, and the, or the European continent. However, homes have people too, and so Buckley would draw on the household labor and knowledge of those around him for his work. His family, as well as friends and colleagues, and the African slave, Hannah. His children would deliver medicines to Weathersfield residents, or sometimes people further afield, on horseback or on foot. Local townspeople would cart his imported goods from the Weathersfield docks, and sometimes bring the much needed coal for his ever hungry furnaces. Fellow Harvard and merchant elites in Connecticut and faraway Massachusetts Bay would help him secure his books, chemical ingredients, and laboratory equipment, while his wife and Hannah would take on much of the day-to-day -day work, helping in the kitchen and in the tending of the household garden, which included medicinal plants. Together, the rooms of this house and their contents, as well as, as its people, would come together to allow a 17th century Connecticut alchemist to experiment, learn, produce, and prescribe for a growing colonial medical marketplace. However, if we could take a step back for a moment to reflect on Buckley's life and circumstances uh, leading up to this pivotal year of 1681, in which he bought his New England salt box. So, uh, and I just wanted to briefly mention that this picture is actually of um, Gershom's father, Peter, but uh, unfortunately there aren't any images that survive of Gershom himself. So I'm assuming here a, a family resemblance, but. So um, Gershom Buckley was born in late 1635 or early 1636 in the just founded town of Concord, Massachusetts. His father, Peter Buckley, was one of Concord's principal founders and spent much of his relatively large inheritance on the establishing of the town. His Gershom's mother, Grace Chetwood, came from an old English noble family that traced its roots back to the signing of the Magna Carta and whose seal much later would be found on Gershon's Weather, Weathersfield grave. Buckley, in short, had a privileged background that set him up for prominence and success in colonial New England. His childhood was spent in Concord, but at the age of 16, he, like other young elites, started his studies at the newly founded Harvard College in Massachusetts Bay. He received a thorough liberal education which included many subjects and some medicine, but most importantly, not any formal instruction or experimental training in alchemy. In 1655, he received his bachelor's degree, and in 1658, his master's. For the next few years, he stayed at Harvard as a tutor, while also marrying the daughter of Harvard president, Charles Chauncey, that is Sarah Chauncey, in late 1658. In 16 61, following the footsteps of both his father and grandfather, he too became a minister, first at the town of New London, Connecticut. Then he, however, he only stayed there for five or so years before becoming Weathersfield's minister in late 1666 or early 1667. And it was here in Weathersfield that he would stay for most of the remainder of his life and where he would raise his family. As, as his extensive library suggests, and that is partly what I've been doing at, at Science History Institute, is looking at his, his library, 
um, Buckley during the 1660s and into the 1670s was purchasing and reading alchemical and medical, medical text to train himself as a physician. No medical school would exist in what would become the 13 colonies for another 100 years. In fact, the very first school was started at the College of Philadelphia in 1765, long after Buckley had lived and died. Instead, Buckley relied on his Harvard education, connections, and personal resources to amass a library which would let him learn about the subjects of alchemy and medicine. There are also a few letters from this period during, uh, between himself and John Winthrop Jr., one of the earliest governors of Connecticut and an alchemist himself, suggesting that Buckley may have received books and advice from the more senior Winthrop. His studies must have been in large part successful for in 1675, he was appointed the surgeon to the Connecticut Army during King Philip's War. For those less familiar with early New England history, this conflict was the last major war between the English and Native Americans in New England. In terms of the percentage of population killed, it was the deadliest conflict in American history with thousands killed on either side when the New England population was quite small, both English and Native American. Buckley's part in the conflict involved traveling with the Connecticut Army and treating the many wounded. He was wounded himself at one point, though not mortally, and continued to treat some of the more seriously injured for some time after the conflict ended in mid-1676. His experience, experiences during this war may be a reason, or even the reason, that Buckley decided to retire from the ministry in 1677 only one year after the end of the conflict. Although his official reason was because of what he described as a weakness of the voice, obviously very important if you are a minister at the pulpit. Buckley was only in his early 40s at this point, but had decided instead of the ministry to devote himself full time to the practice of medicine and alchemy. He had many decades still ahead of him. So returning then to Buckley's 1681 purchase of uh, this New England salt box, I want to today focus on a specific feature of what I will call Buckley's household science, a term I'm borrowing from the scholar Elaine Leong. Namely, I want to examine how he filled this. A newly purchased chest of drawers, like this one here depicted, from the Weathersfield furniture maker Peter Blinn which he also purchased like his home in 1681. How ultimately did a blend piece such as this one, which sat in Buckley's parlor, where he saw his patients and prescribed medicines, ultimately come to be filled with alchemical wares? How did he amass the ingredients, goods, books, and laboratory equipment necessary to fill these drawers? While this may seem like it has a simple answer, I will argue that Buckley and those in his home had to constantly work to acquire ingredients and equipment from, both, uh, from a wide range of sources, both local and far flung. This required establishing specific personal connections with wholesalers in Boston and of writing to and borrowing from many people in Buckley's network of friends and colleagues. It also required growing and maintaining a farm, garden, and orchard, and of becoming aware of what usefully grew in the forest and meadows nearby. Further, it sometimes required substitu substituting some less than ideal ingredients and materials when the better sort, in Buckley's opinion at least, could not be acquired. At times this meant local and other times very local indeed from the products and material of the house itself. So beginning then with a the source of goods that might seem to be the most important, uh, the most likely and simple, trade, Around the time that Buckley was buying his house and his chest of drawers, he was also working to connect himself to the burgeoning Atlantic trade of the late 17th century. This was not simple work as Buckley could not rely on an established trade network of medical wares in New England, especially as he lived two weeks upriver away from the coast and far from the main New England city of Boston. He had to personally build and maintain his network instead. He did so first by utilizing his brother Peter's connections as a merchant and by working within Weathersfield's warehouses and docks. 
the last remaining example seen here. This role was more open to many in the town because of Weathersfield's small population and infrequent shipping. Peter's trips to Boston in the 1680s gave Buckley his initial opportunities to acquire goods and ingredients that he could not manufacture or purchase from local merchants. However, Buckley didn't just build his network at the local Weathersfield docks. He also traveled himself to help establish and secure goods for his alchemical preparations. For a period in early 1681, perhaps just a few months, he went far south to the newly acquired English Caribbean island of Antigua, supporting William Willis, who was trying to invest in the production of plantation sugar there. And uh, Antigua is located approximately here. Uh, Willis, a fellow Harvard graduate, two years Buckley senior, would ultimately be unsuccessful and deeply in debt by 1685. However, upon his return to Weathersfield and before Willis's ultimate failure with Antigua Sugar, Buckley was selling Willis's wares to Weathersfield residents in the early 1680s, while also doing his work as an alchemist and physician. While these roles may seem to cover, cover separate spheres, they were deeply connected. Buckley utilized large amounts of sugar and also honey and molasses in his alchemical medicines as a means of creating a palatable vehicle, as he would call it. Indeed, his chest of drawers were filled with medicines with a base of sugar, showing an increasing combination of American and European ingredients and colonial consumables and an increasing dependence on a product produced through slave labor. For just one example, in his recipe for electuary colobiate, he covers the taste of his vitriol of Mars with, quote, the very best clarified honey and the whitest sugar. No doubt this sugar came from Antigua or another English-held Caribbean island to Buckley's south. In addition to his work at the docks and his time in Antigua, he also connected early on with the Boston apothecary, Benjamin Davis. Davis was the son of Captain William Davis, who was a member of the Ancient and Ar Honorable Artillery Company and one of the founders of Boston's Old South Church. Davis's mother, Margaret, was the daughter of William Pynchon, founder of Springfield, Massachusetts, and a famed medical supplier himself. Davis followed in his father's footsteps as a major Boston apothecary and artilleryman, and remained, it seems, the main contact for Buckley until Davis's death in December of 1704. Boston and Davis remained the main source of English and European goods for Buckley throughout his life. Getting books and other materials, though, was not always easy and required not just waiting on the next ship to come up river to Weathersfield, but also for the next family member to head to Massachusetts Bay. After his brother Peter had died, it seems, he increasingly relied on his sons for this purpose. For instance, when writing to Benjamin Davis in 1699, Buckley thanks him for, quote, the medicines you sent me by my, my son Peter, and goes on to request you by him to send me a few things more, indicating a relationship where goods were often being requested of Davis, particularly through familial intermediaries. These requests often included the exchange of books. In the same letter, Davis writes, uh, Buckley writes to Davis, quote, that I have Dr. Allen's book, which he lent me. He needs it not now, and so if his executor will part with it and let me know the price, I will pay for it. However, beyond books, Buckley request, Buckley's requests could at times be quite eclectic and specific, as he would sometimes put in the time to describe both the quality and kind he required. In 1701, for instance, he wrote to Davis, quote, I must request you also, if you can, to spare me a glass jar or two that will hold three pints or two quarts apiece, or less if you have none so big. Some of them, you know, have spouts or capels at the bottom, but they are not for my use. Now, as for the aloes, if it be possible, let it not be Barbados aloe, but succotrine. Succotrine aloe, unlike its Caribbean cousin, would not have come from the Americas, but further south still at the Cape of South Africa. 
However, Buckley's network grew further beyond even Davis in Boston as he found direct connections to Eng in England to acquire his goods, although the evidence for this network is rather thin. At times, he will make references to a letter or two coming, either coming or going to England, indicating that he was in at least infrequent communication with people there. One very likely source for goods and for correspondence is his older brother, John, who had also graduated from Harvard, but 13 years earlier than Buckley, and had then decided to move to London to also practice physic for some time until his ultimate death in 1689. His ties to Buckley were made clear in his will when John left him along with his other living brothers in New England, 20 shillings apiece. However, in addition to John, there were other Buckleys who had never left, New, uh, left England for Massachusetts Bay. These included an especially wealthy branch and a niece of Buckley's that named him in her will when she passed. Yet Buckley does make one clear reference to London in one of his surviving laboratory notebooks. In a memorandum for October 15, 1706, he writes, quote, this day received a hogshead, that is a uh, barrel, of glasses from Brother Isaac in London. Brother Isaac refers to Buckley's brother-in-law, Isaac Chauncey, the eldest son of Harvard President Charles Chauncey, and a 1681 graduate, uh, sorry, 1651 graduate. Chauncey, after Harvard, had continued his education in England and remained there for the rest of his life, and it seems was a contact for Buckley when he needed precious laboratory equipment such as glassware. Glassware was a good that Buckley simply could not acquire locally, and he spent a good deal of time indeed trying to acquire it. He could not rely on a domestic glass industry in the 17th century, as those attempts to sustain such ventures generally only lasted a few years. In fact, prior to the American Revolution, almost no glass was produced locally in the Connecticut River Valley region. For instance, in Elizabeth Pratt Fox's analysis of ceramics and glassware in 17th century inventories for this region, she found that in the 1660 to 1684 period, less than 10% of inventories included glass. However, Buckley may have benefited from a dramatic jump in glass availability in the period we are examining just after. For Fox also notes that between 1685 and 1705, 59% of households now included glassware. However, it is important to note, though, that despite Pratt's numbers, that glassware was not glassware, as Buckley required very specific, specialized wares for his chemical work. For the average house possession, uh, glass possession involved a few fashionable pieces for display and not the day-to-day -day laboratory use that Buckley was talking about. Yet, though connections such as his Yet through connections such as his brother-in-law, Buckley largely succeeded in acquiring this glass, for when he died, a large number of glass vials, jars, and other containers were listed within his inventory. The appraisers list 11 glass funnels, 136 glass vials, and other glass vessels of light nature, as well as five glass cases, unfortunately, many of them low and broken. Other listings are less clear on the exact breakdown of glassware to other materials, such as 91 stone jugs, glasses, and other chemical ware. However, Buckley's laboratory did not just need glassware, as his day-to-day -day work involved many tools and implements. In his inventory is listed two iron furnaces with other utensils necessary to stirring. Uh, it was from such furnaces that Buckley would produce many of his medicines. While there is no mention in the records of the source of these furnaces, other earlier alchemists, such as John Winthrop Jr., had imported their furnaces. Buckley himself may have relied on help from local artisans to help construct his furnaces with directions from the books in his library. To support these furnaces, Buckley used a vast array of other goods listed in his inventory, such as two glass mortars, about 30 crucibles, two iron mortars, iron kettles, brass kettles, skillets, and uh, iron and brass skillets, as well as the spatula. These items, in addition to existing in pairs in the inventory, perhaps one for each furnace, 
also vary in their material shape and possible use. While some of the, these may have come from local merchants, as they also would tend to exist in homes for cooking, Buckley may also have found ways to import such materials directly from his connections in London and England. So far, I've emphasized the ways that Buckley built his extended network in order to acquire the goods chemical ingredients, books and tools that he needed to research, produce, and prescribe his alchemical medicines. However, as already mentioned, Buckley was a farmer with fields, a garden, and an orchard. Such nearby resources, whether from his own household, a neighbor's, or nature, were central in his medicines and their production. In his garden, for instance, he grew the ingredients common to most household English households, which he references in his Vita Mecum. He recommends having, quote, the five greater roots, so-called parsley, sparage, fennel, stone parsley, and butcher's broom. For the five lesser opening roots, he suggests grass, capers, oringo, or sea holly, camac, or rest hero, and madder. In his day-to-day -day visits, he also frequently prescribes prepared plants, such as rhubarb, and his garden very well could have cultivated some of the berries he brewed, such as juniper. In his orchard, he cultivated fruit, and in particular, their seeds for him to crush and process in his furnaces. While it is unclear exactly what his orchard contained, he does mention the planting of oranges on May 6, 1682, not long after the purchase of his home. Common also for the time were apple trees, and Buckley very well could have grown these himself, as he at times recommended his patients consume his medicines in cider. However, living on a farm meant the use of animals too, as Buckley often prescribed bezoar stones to his patients, which were often cut from the stomachs of various animals. Buckley recommended to his grandson Richard Treat, for example, that it be made from the gall of a rattlesnake, but also said that other animals such as bears, oxen, sheep, hogs, etc., might thus be employed to very good purposes. All such animals were either nearby in the woods or right on Buckley's, near, Buckley's or a neighbor's farm. In another instance, in preparing his most excellent clister for the fluxes, and um, apologies for the vegetarians, but uh, Buckley uses a, quote, fresh sheep's head cut into pieces and boiled in water till the flesh is separated from the bones. Frequent throughout his recipes, too, is the presence of hog's fat, such as in his ointment of mercury, where he calls for likely imported mercury dissolved in aqua fortis, to which one then adds, quote, fresh and good, good hog's fat without salt. Such additions are no doubt related to the presence of such substances around him and the fact that he owned hogs as well as cattle himself. Buckley and his family also draw from the resources of the nearby woods. For example, he recommends, quote, for some, some purposes as wounds, etc., the ashes of the lime tree, which we here in Connecticut call bass. For some of his plasters, that is medical paste applied to the skin, he recommends drawing from nearby riverbeds, gathering, quote, the finest red clay that you can find newly dug. The meadows were also a common source for ingredients, as Buckley recommended uh, frequently list plants such as wild clove, wild gourd, black and white hellebore, prunella, and scurvy grass. Sipping in many of these ingredients was likely not an option for Buckley, as he frequently calls for unspoiled new ingredients. For instance, for the making of his Cantari's Potential, Buckley writes that you should, quote, take the new and fresh ashes of the wood and bark of the ash tree, for in a few days they lose their vigor. In some cases, then, local ingredients just had to do for Buckley, as the long transit across the Atlantic would mean lost potency. However, it wasn't just plants that Buckley and his family drew from. Wild animals were also a frequent source for Buckley, as he at times would prescribe the use of such substances as oleum castorum, that is the oil derived from beaver sacs. Sometimes animals from the woods were brought to him, 
For instance, in his recipe for bezoar stones, as was previously mentioned, he preferred the use of rattlesnake gall. At times, neighbors brought him such snakes as credit against their debt for his previous work as their doctor. In making such a medicine too, Buckley writes, quote, if the air happened to be rainy and moist, when the snake hath hung a while, we may dry him in a warm oven after the baking of bread. In act, I imagine others in the household, particularly Buckley's wife, Sarah, or Hannah, do not much appreciate at the time. Another common recipe was his jelly of heart's horn, which consisted of, of the shavings of local deer's antlers boiled and congealed into a soft jelly. In fact, heart's horn was quite a common ingredient in his medicines, and at times his accounts list neighbors bringing him venison. With such meat may very well come the heart's horn he required. However, beyond local ingredients for his medicines, he needed goods and instruments for his laboratory. For looting, that is the reinforcing of laboratory vessels by applying a, a coating on the outside, he recommends the use of, quote, fine wheat or rye flowers, rye is best, and fine sand, an equal weight of each, and to then mix and make them into a soft paste with beer and water. For fixing the cracks in laboratory vessels, he writes, I have sometimes used quicklime in the whites of eggs beaten to water. Lime would have been an easy enough substance to obtain for the Buckleys, perhaps from local carpenters who used it for the construction of homes. However, some of the material for the most important piece of alchemical equipment is furnace. Seem, he seems to have gathered from nearby. Buckley writes to his grandson, quote, when you distill in glass vessels in the furnace, whether in sand or ashes, see that your sand or ashes be well sifted from pebbles, gross gravel, coals, and all, all hard knots and lumps. No doubt pebbles and gravel from the nearby pond or Connecticut coast. For vessels too, Buckley didn't just rely on the expensive chemical glassware that he was able to import from England, but also the products of local potters. In fact, these local goods may very well have outnumbered the glassware he had in his laboratory. In his inventory are listed about 80 jugs, jars, galley pots, or mugs. The, uh, these items were likely made of local clay and glazed by local potters. At times, the local sourcing is made all too apparent, such as in his laboratory notebook, where he describes on January 27, 1702, that, quote, I distilled in a common potter's pitcher, a New England ware, about half a pound of nitre. At other times, he refers to, quote, his little blue jug, which he used to hold his arsenic. Relying on these more common local goods became central in some processes because they were disposable. Describing his process for the production of balsamus fuliginus, Buckley notes that, quote, it will go near to cost you three pots. Buckley could ill afford such a cost if it came in the form of this imported glassware. However, before any work could begin, Buckley had to acquire fuel for his furnaces and his chimneys. He turned most often to coals, that is charcoal, produced from the local woods. Important to emphasize is that although Buckley often corresponded and connected with his apothecary Benjamin David, Davis in Boston, his account books attest to an enormous amount of personal production in his laboratory. While single entries for the purchase of coals come up often in, in his account books, one very striking purchase, which perhaps best illustrates the scale of Buckley's household production, occurred on October 18th, 1703, when, quote, 392 bushels of coal were purchased for Mr. Buckley. To put this in perspective, about four bushels filled a wooden barrel at the time. Buckley's large order for his alchemical laboratory drew on the labor of four local men who cut the wood for the coal, prepared it, and delivered it to his home. In a final brief section, I would like to speak a little to when things didn't work out. That is, at times, Buckley, despite the work of himself, his household, friends, neighbors, and distant contacts, could not get what he wanted for his alchemical laboratory. 
This could go to the very heart of his chemical work, namely in the quantity and quality of his glassware. While I have already noted the large collection of glassware Buckley had at the time he passed, this it seem, seems was not enough to meet the demands of his patients. Writing to his grandson Richard in 1705, he states, quote, that glass vessels are scarce with us and hard to be gotten and are easily broken in this work and instead recommends local wares. But a wide mouth stone jug that is sound and firm will serve the turn very well. He didn't just use glassware though for preparation in the laboratory as he often sent patients home with medicines in a glass vial for consuming later. To compensate for the scarcity of these vials, it seems, Buckley began to charge his patients for them, providing them with a rebate to their account if they returned them promptly. At other times, he even made do with other vessels such as local pots or even wooden boxes. But it wasn't just glassware that Buckley had trouble acquiring. Often it was, it was the ingredients themselves. Buckley notes at times medical recipes he thinks are worthwhile, but only if their ingredients can somehow be acquired. For instance, in his discussion of the production of a balsam mortary of Mars, he writes that, quote, without question, it is an exceeding good balsam, but you will hardly here get the red oil of turpentine to make it of. With another balsam, the balsam mortary of sulfur, Buckley again notes the difficulty of supply, writing, quote, I could never yet buy any red or yellow oil of turpentine, nor sufficient store of turpentine and vessels to distill it myself, though I have much desired it for other uses as well as this one. Balsams like these were not small medicines either, as they often served as key treatments for the wounds of war. Buckley himself likely looked to balsams as key medicines when he treated the injured and dying during King Philip's War from 1675 to 1676. Day-to-day -day medicines could also become scarce as Buckley at times would lament in responding to the request of his far away patients. As his reputation grew, some saw fit to write letters to Buckley to request medicines sent to them. In one response to a Michael Sultan saw, Buckley advised, quote, the use of wormwood or juniper wine, a cup of it to be taken an hour before every repast. However, I am out of juniper berries and so could send none. I sent to Boston for some by my son, Peter, but you know how I am very disappointed. Here, we can almost hear the resignation behind Buckley's quill, as he thinks no doubt on the many times he has been unable to fulfill a patient's request. However, there were many reasons why Buckley could not easily expect to acquire goods from faraway Boston. Sometimes the ice-packed Connecticut River in the dead of New England winter had other plans for the alchemist, and he could not rely even on his young sons to make the trip north. One winter, he writes to ben Benjamin Davis, quote, your money hath waited for you a long time, but we have been so buried in snow this winter that I've had no opportunity to send it to you. He continues, I am out of drugs and want a supply. Being out of saffron and wanting it very much, I sent to Hartford to see if any might be had there. It was now this last winter. And one man had a little and could spare me but one ounce. Buckley makes clear that he has been cut off from both Boston and London for much of the winter and been unable to request goods or receive them. Sometimes ships were rare to come at all for reasons aside from snow and ice. Buckley writes to Davis in 1704, quote, I have been, I have seen but one ship, one ship of all last year, and that was in March, a month of little action. I could be glad to understand how things go in the world. In 1704, it wasn't the winter that cut Buckley off from Boston and London, but war, as ships and supplies were stopped by the conflict in Europe over the Spanish succession. Although Buckley had worked hard to build his network, other forces often revealed how vulnerable it really was. But while a dearth of goods may seem to be a mere inconvenience, at times it was actually a crucible of creativity. Without the ingredients he sees listed in the medical recipes of his books, he turns to those sources he has at hand. 
For example, in making Rulandis's balsam of sulfur, Buckley writes, quote, that for external use, I have in want of salad oil, often made of balsam of sulfur, by the gentle boiling of the, of the fine salt powder of sulfur in hog's fat. And so the alchemist, who is also a farmer, finds use for the pigs he has on his farm nearby. In another instance, he clearly turns to the family dinner table with his preparation for his conserve of roses. He writes, quote, then let the ingredients ferment or work a while in a well-glazed or clean earthen pot and cover that pot with a trencher. For those less familiar with colonial history, a trencher is perhaps the most common household object at the time. That is a wooden plate made by digging out a trench from a piece of wood. Now, it wasn't just plates, though. At times, he would also turn to other common house household objects in making his diaceltsin simple. He writes to, quote, filter it once and again, if need be, through a cloth linen or a cotton cloth or bag. Such cloth likely came from his own home made by his wife or Hannah, or it was traded to him by neighbors for credit against their accounts. Um, so I would suggest then with all these examples uh, that at Buckley's household science or his making do in these instances is not too dissimilar from what we're seeing today as we're cooped up at home, that is ironing boards as standing desk, for example. In conclusion, I would like to end my talk today by emphasizing the theme of family, which I hope came through at least in part in this talk. Although Buckley was the principal alchemist, he was not the only person involved in alchemy, nor this process of collecting and making within his colonial scientific household. He drew on his children to deliver his medicines and perhaps pick the plants in the nearby fields and forest, and to preserve these local ingredients for his cellar. He turned to his wife too to run much of the day-to-day -day life of the household and to help raise those, ch those children. Lastly, he turned to his African slave, Hannah, whose efforts and contribution in places like the kitchen and garden to this household science have as of yet been unacknowledged. All of this is to emphasize that this colonial household science in all of its parts was not defined as armchair alchemy, involving careful and isolated study in a closed off laboratory, but rather as part of an integrated whole of family colonial slavery and New England life. And that is why towards the end of his life, Buckley thought and hoped to pass on this household science, its knowledge as well as its material goods to his children and grandchildren. He did this first by writing his Vita Mecum, a document which I've drawn on for much of today's analysis in which he poured his knowledge of medical recipes, both the efficacy of certain ingredients he collected as well as the best processes for their production. He also then passed on the household itself, or rather the material seed of the scientific household by transferring his laboratory equipment, the glassware, pots, pans, and furnaces, which he had collected across many decades to his daughter, Dorothy, and his grandson, Richard Treat. And so this household science, founded on the town green in Wethersfield in 1681, was passed on in 1713 at Buckley's death to his descendants to another home across the river in Glastonbury, Connecticut. Thank you. Thank you very much, George, uh, for that hugely evocative talk uh, with its uh, resonant themes of household and improvisation. Uh, certainly, um, certainly really embedded um, um, Buckley's practice of alchemy in, in his, his daily life there. So um, let me open things up for questions. I should say anyone on the telephone who's calling can email me a question at lunchtimelectures at sciencehistory.org. That's lunchtimelectures at sciencehistory.org if you have a question. Um, otherwise, my chat window is open. So let me go over first to uh, BJ Parrish, please. Are you there, BJ? 
Well, if BJ's not there, I can ask, certainly ask his question, George, which is, um, can you tell us something about the alchemical medicines um, during um, Buckley's time uh, and their uses, please? Oh, George, you're uh, yeah. Thousands of, sorry, um, there are really, there are hundreds of, and thousands really of different kinds of medicines. They, um, and they vary in the way that they're applied. Some are consumed, you know, and in, in his case, um, and as was common at the time, because they tasted so bad often, um, they would be put in other things like beer or wine. Uh, so Buckley produced his own beer and wine. He brewed it in his attic um, so that he could uh, give that to, to patients that could actually consume it. Uh, so they, they drank the medicine often, um, uh, and often they would, um, he would create a paste um, that he would apply either directly to the skin or it would be applied to um, cloth wrappings that would be put on wounds. Um, a lot of that he developed during um, his time as a surgeon during the war. Um, so, you know, all kinds of variations on that. Um, and the you know, common um, ailments that people suffered from at the time, worms were quite common. So he had a, he had a, a drink that he would prescribe for people to deal with worms. Um, you know, injuries were very, very common. People worked on farms and out, and out in the woods. So they, they broke legs, they, they, you know, hurt themselves in all kinds of ways. Um, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of all kinds of things. But. Thanks, George. Um, I, I had a question for you. Um, I, as you were going through your talk, I, I um, made a note of the sources that you have been using, and they were very, very varied. I had uh, letters, public records, um, his inventory at death. Um, various paintings that you displayed and, and, and so on. No doubt you're also using um, books, uh, chemical books in our collection. So um, the, the one thing that I, w I was intrigued by was uh, that you, you didn't seem to draw on so much was that the chest of drawers. Um, I wondered if there was anything um, in the material evidence um, that um, indicated uh, different kinds of alchemical practices or relationships with other kinds of um, features in, in, in Buckley's household. Yeah. So, um, and I, I hope I made clear that, that, that actually isn't his specific chest of drawers, but that is one of the, there, there are numerous examples that survive from this, this one furniture maker, Peter Blinn, that was kind of, um, viewed as kind of a, uh, an impressive figure at, at the time. So he produced um, furniture for a lot of the elites within central Connecticut. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm certainly hoping to integrate uh, the furniture in some way. Um, so the chest of drawers, um, I, I didn't mention this, but one of the, I, I'm, I'm thinking of the chest of drawers specifically as a kind of technology of sorts, because um, at the period, you actually had this transition in the furniture where um, just before Buckley's life, maybe his father or his grandfather, they, um, they would have used um, probably a chest, right? You know, just sitting on the floor. Um, but his chest of drawers was actually a hybrid kind of technology. Um, the very top part of it was a chest so you could open it up and, and reach down in to get things. And then the bottom part was actually drawers that opened up. So um, the technology of actually furniture was, was changing and his purchase of this particular piece indicates, I think, a kind of a decision of sorts to organize and kind of organize in a way that's very uh, current um, to kind of what's available at the time. So where is that, that actual piece that you showed um, in your, one of your earlier slides? There, there's one at, um, I believe there's one at the Metropolitan uh, uh, Museum of Art in New York City. Um, there are a few pieces that are in kind of local um, museums and antiquarian societies in Massachusetts and Connecticut too. Um, but there, I mean, there's there's a few there's a few pieces that are kind of located around New England. So, okay, I have um, several questions. I'm not sure we'll have time for them all. So, um, when you ask your question, do please 
bear that in mind. Can we go over now to Tony, please? Are you there, Tony? So let me ask uh, Tony's question. I'm um, oh, sorry. Oh, are you there, Tony? Great. That's fantastic. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, I was wondering uh, if he, uh, if, it is, if there's any evidence to suggest he knew George Starkey, because um, I know that George Starkey was around this time practicing. Um, I, you know, I haven't run it across any evidence. Um, the, the, the connections across the Atlantic um, to people in England are really very, um, there are just not very many um, at all, unfortunately. So I mean, he, he spent obviously most of his life in central Connecticut. So um, if he had a connection, he would have been exchanging letters probably, but um, I, I haven't run across anything as of yet. Thanks, Tony. Our next question Thanks. is from Sally. Sally, are you there, please? Hello? Hello. Okay, so I am here, uh, but I'm Great. not sure if I was. So I was. Um, Implications. So I was curious if they had to market or advertise. Did they have a lot of other competition in other types of medicine? Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the question is about because um, um, you cut out a little bit there. The question is just about um, uh, alchemist practitioners like. Barclay, whether they made consistent profits or had to market and advertise themselves and if they were competing in a marketplace, essentially. So, um, yeah, he, uh, I think, mostly advertised in word of mouth. Uh, I think that's what happened. Um, so one of the things I've noticed as I look at his account books is that over time, um, the kind of ratio of very local patients to far away patients kind of shifts. So he begins to kind of treat people from further away. Towards the end of his life, I start noticing a couple people from New York, for instance. Um, so his kind of the range of patients he's treating clearly kind of grows. Um, and he, I think he becomes known as kind of a specialist. Um, the fact that he's able to produce these medicines locally and in such volume certainly puts him at a kind of top tier for, uh, you know, physicians in New England at the time. So that kind of gave him a reputation. Many of the other um, physicians were also, um, they didn't necessarily use chemical medicine as much. They might use more traditional like bloodletting and other techniques to kind of balance the humors. Um, when he died, interestingly enough, they, um, he had developed such a reputation on the, I guess, in the, the medical marketplace that uh, they put up these, um, um, these like, uh, like hangings and things, uh, I should, billboards, uh, not billboards. Um, uh, they hung out sheets of paper around uh, the square in New, New London. I think there was one in uh, Boston. So there's the broad, broad sheets that were around uh, that wrote like an alchemical poem, basically. Um, praising his skill and, and reputation. Um, so he was, he was widely known uh, across New England um, for his skill. Uh, our next question is from uh, Alex. Is that here? Alex Cooper, please. Um, yes, thank you. Um, and it, it, that is indeed how it's pronounced. Um, my question was just a very simple one, uh, whether there's any evidence of alchemical or medical leanings of his while he was at Harvard, or if there's just no evidence of that whatsoever. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I still do need to look a little bit closer at his time at Harvard, but it's not, I mean, the actual... Um, records of Harvard are very scarce. It's it's kind of like um, 
basically what he bought when he was there. It's so it's very like, um, you know, very minimal, you know, whether he got a pair of shoes, something like that, um, what food he purchased. So um, that's kind of scarce. I mean, you can look at uh, the, distrib- the, the theses that were written at the time. Um, William Newman in his work on George Starkey, who was an alchemist, uh, before uh, Buckley, he was young. Uh, he was older than Buckley. Um, William Newman has written a little bit on how you get some alchemical theory and things through uh, basically their study of uh, natural philosophy and other things. But um, but yeah, I, not too much is is known, and not specifically. I, I don't. I haven't run across much specifically on Buckley and what he could have gotten. But a lot of it comes through. I think um, kind of connections, friends, family, exchanging books and letters. And unfortunately, there's not many letters that survive um, for Buckley. So, but again, that's, I feel like that's largely where he's getting it. It's not necessarily directly from Harvard. It's, it's from local, you know, it's from elites in New, New, New England that are kind of talking about this and trying things out. Got it. Thank you. Fascinating. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, George. Um, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. I've actually got a list here of five to six questions, and uh, I'm sorry that some of you didn't get a chance to put your question to George. But if you uh, do want to follow up, then just send your question to lunchtime lectures at sciencehistory.org, uh, and I'll make sure George gets those questions, and um, um, we'll, we'll see what we can do about returning the answers to you.